into paganism? Or is your first history and heritage something that runs back through the church into ancient Israel and back to Noah and back to Adam? Okay? You see, what enables people from all different places to come together in here is that we all have the same history. And that's the church. And that's our central history. What is your first cultural history? It's the history of the church. Where do you look to shape up church music? To modern popular styles? To modern art music styles? Or do you look back through the history of the church as far as you can look? You see the difference? This is an important issue because the idea now is, well, we've got to stir up the church, uh, uh, revive the church, and what we do is we go grab hold of whatever is out in the world which isn't necessarily good, bad, or indifferent, but it's not the place we look for first. Yes, it is true that I'm also an American. I also have a Norman French background. My ancestors were pagans in Europe a long time ago. But that's not my first history. I've been grafted into a different history. And my first and most important history is the history of the sanctuary. You know what that means? That means that everything that's true and right and beautiful in the Roman Catholic Church belongs to me. I'm the heir. So are you. Everything that's true and beautiful and right in the Russian Orthodox Church belongs to you. Everything that's true and beautiful and right in the Lutheran and Reformed Churches belongs to you. You may want to filter out some of it, but it's all yours. You're the heir. You're the heirs of everything that's ever been true and right in the church first, and you secondly, you're the heir of everything that's true and right in the world. It all belongs to us. The wicked, it says in the Bible, lay up an inheritance for the righteous. Who invented the first musical instruments? Pagans. Now they're ours. Genesis 4 says that. Jubal, the son of Lamech, invented the first musical instruments. Who invented our agriculture? Pagans. Now it's ours. Let them do the work. Let them sweat. We'll inherit it. <laughs> but the first thing we're the true heirs of is the historic church. And that would be, if you want to overcome these problems we've talked about, look back at the church. And now I'm done. There's just one musical example left. And this is what I like to end with, because this is one of my favorite pieces of music for a number of different reasons. The composer is Alexander Kuchaninov. Remember him? This is the great prayer from his domestic liturgy. Domestic means it has musical instruments along with it, which is unusual for the Eastern Church. And this is from the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. It's Eastern music. These, this is a prayer. What you're going to listen to is a song prayer. And it's a prayer, basically, where the man who says the prayers prays a line and then the choir and congregation have a refrain. Now, the refrain is, Lord, have mercy upon us, and the prayer is a series of petitions for the peace of the whole world and for the well-being of all the churches of God. We pray thee, Lord. Lord, have mercy upon us. Now, Lord, have mercy upon us does not mean forgive us our sins. It means give us the kingdom. Condescend to give us the kingdom. For our armed forces and for those who are suffering in other lands, Lord, give us the kingdom. And there's one petition after another, and then as he sings them, and then the choir and congregation uh, join in. The idea in the Eastern Church, and uh, theoretically in our churches, is that you go into heaven to worship. Now that has meant for them that they try real hard to create as glorious a sound as possible in their music. And this has that. Uh, also, what, the way the effect that this music has of the choir and the congregation and the singer, you will hear it's as if a vast multitude of people are pouring out these prayers one after another. And this is based on what the book of Revelation says when it shows us worship in heaven, it shows us the pattern in heaven, and it shows us several choirs all throwing prayer at God. Myriads upon myriads. I heard the voice of a tremendous multitude singing, Worthy is the Lamb. And I heard another voice came in and said, Hallelujah, Worthy is the Lamb. And they just these prayers were poured before God one after another in heaven. That was the, was the model in the church. So that's what this sounds like. Now, another reason I like this is that it's kind of hard to hear. Okay. This was recorded in the 20s. I taped it off the radio. So it's going to be kind of like listening to something that's up in heaven in certain terms of the quality. It may not sound immediate. But I want you to play this for you 
If you like it, it's yours. If you don't like it, you don't have to use it. I like it. But you're the true heir of this. And as a matter of fact, there's nothing in this that your church couldn't do if you decided you wanted to. Maybe it wouldn't be a good idea in Huntsville. Maybe you wouldn't dare try anything like this. But it's not hard to sing. The congregational part would be real easy to do. It's sung in Slavonic, not in English. So just imagine that you're in a church service. The service has been going on for a while. You've already sung a lot. Now it's time to really pour out your prayers to God. And the bass is going to pray the prayers, and we will just join in, Lord have mercy upon us, and wash these prayers up before the throne of God. It's the impression you get from listening to this. It's very dynamic.
that was highly emotionally charged music? You really get a sensation of something there, don't you? Well, believe it or not, that's the way some people in the world worship. It's not that hard to do. Again, what we can do growing out of where we are, but where we are is the whole history of the church, depends on a lot of factors, who you are, where you live. But that's all part of our heritage. Anything that's beautiful in the whole history of the church is ours. That concludes my lecture. I'd like for us to stay a few minutes and sing a couple of Lutheran chorales, if we could. Um, if you have to go, fine. But it would be good for us to sample a couple of other things that, that are in our, our history and tradition. So take the sheet that has a mighty fortress on it. If you don't have one, there should be some of them. And let me supplement the lecture now by showing you how enthusiastic music was at the time of the Reformation. Now tomorrow night we'll try a Geneva psalm or two. But because we have psalms in particular tomorrow night, I've done other things during the conference. But this is the rhythm to a mighty fortress as it was originally sung. <laughs> Thank you.
There's a little bit more flavor in this, where it says, He's by our side upon the plain. I get a real visual impact from that lot. I want to play you one more, and then we can go home. This goes up kind of high, so you can only sing it high. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. This is from about a century later. by Paul here. And it sounds like this. <clears throat> Found us in a place. You just have to have to learn.
Alright, you may sit down. And that concludes me for tonight. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, let's all bow for prayer. Thank you, Father, for our time together this evening, for the stimulating realization of your greatness through history. May we indeed take advantage of the heritage we have because of godly men and women who have so carefully sought you out and who themselves have been sought out by your spirit and therefore have given us these great riches which are ours. Bless us as we seek to take advantage of them and live in the light of every breath. Prepare us now for the Lord today tomorrow. May we indeed come to celebrate and rejoice in the risen Christ. Enjoy him and his presence throughout the day tomorrow. Bless uh, Jim especially as he prepares to speak to us and lead our worship in many ways. We pray in Christ. Happy to have the Reverend Jim Jordan with us for our fall Bible conference this year. We've been enjoying the last three days, Friday, Saturday, now Sunday, the third day, uh, with him under his ministry. And I don't want to take a long time to introduce him. Uh, he has been a pastor. He is an author. He has books that we, I think we've bought him out this year so far. So you can't buy any more of them now. You can order them. Uh, we've been delighted with his ministry. It's been a blessing to our hearts. I invite you to give careful attention to God's Word as Mr. Jordan comes to minister to us. The scripture lesson will be from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 21. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not become drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless our understanding of the Scriptures this day. Send your Spirit to us to guide our thoughts. Bless me as I teach and the congregation as they hear. We pray in the name of Christ our King. Amen. The book of Ephesians basically has two parts. In chapters 1 to 3, the apostle under the guidance of the Holy Spirit tells us a great deal of very deep and profound doctrine. And in chapters 4 to 6, he makes application of those doctrines. In chapters 1 to 3, he tells us about the kingdom that Christ has brought to us. And it's interesting to note in chapter 1 that the very first thing he does in presenting the kingdom of God is he utters a long, long prayer to God the Father through Christ the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he talks about the nature of the kingdom and how Jew and Gentile are included together in it. And in beginning in chapter 4, he makes application and says, because all of us are one body in Christ, we need to live like it. And that's where we come to chapter 5, verse 15 having made a strong application about the fact that we are all one in Christ and therefore the distinctions that were there formerly are broken down and we are all in the same room worshiping the same God. He goes on in verse 15 to say, Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise men, but as, men, uh, as wise. These are exhortations on the Christian walk. How do we walk as Christians? Well, not as unwise people, but as wise people. He goes on from this, talking about this walk, in verses 22 of chapter 5, to say, Wives, be husband to your subjects. Uh, sir, excuse me, wives, be subject to your husbands. In chapter 6, he says, Children, obey your parents. 
Uh, verse 5 of chapter 6, servants be obedient to your masters. And finally, in verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You remember many of these passages, I'm sure. But before he goes on to talk about these interpersonal relationships that we have in life and in the body of Christ, he says something about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It seems that this is a somewhat more foundational matter even than our personal relationships because it sets the key and the tone for our personal relationships. If we're going to live as one body in Christ in this new kingdom, this is one of the most foundational aspects of that life, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. That's what we want to think about for a few minutes this morning. The first thing that the Apostle says in verse 17 to us is, Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be drunk with wine, for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now we know from the Scripture that wine is one of the gifts of God. Uh, Jesus instituted wine at the Lord's Supper. He turned turned water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana. Judges chapter 9, verse 13 says that wine cheers the heart of God and man. We also know, I'm sure, that wine is something that can be abused, like all of God's gifts. In the Bible, wine was for celebration and also for medicine. The Bible tells us that a life of drunkenness causes dissipation. It causes dissipation. Now, what is dissipation? Well, basically, it's the opposite of concentration. A dissipated life is a life that doesn't have a center. A dissipated person is a person who is not able to follow a conversation or anything. He's not able to concentrate and put his mind on things. And this is the the horror of drunkenness, a life of drunkenness and drug addiction, drug abuse problems in our society today. It destroys the concentration of the mind. It destroys the focus of the life when God's good gifts are abused selfishly. And what does he say is the reverse of this? He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The opposite of dissipation is concentration. It's the filling of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that enables us to live a concentrated life that focuses us on the central and most important thing, which is our relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We don't want to live a dissipated life. We don't want to destroy our minds. We don't want to pickle our brains in alcohol. Rather, we want to be transformed by the Holy Spirit and have a mind and a life that's concentrated and focused on the task that God has given to us, but first of all, on the Lord himself. He says to be filled with the Spirit in verse 18. What does that mean? I I need to take a couple of minutes on this because many of us were taught that being filled with the Spirit is something that happens instantly by an act of the will. If you confess your sins, then you're filled with the Spirit. And you're either filled with the Spirit or you're not filled with the Spirit and you're living a carnal life as a Christian. The people who developed that way of teaching intended something very good. They were trying to stimulate us to righteousness. Uh, They were trying to say, stop sinning. Be filled with the Spirit and live righteously. But I don't think that that's exactly what the filling of the Spirit is in this passage. Certainly, if we're out of source with God, if we're nervous about approaching God, if we're not in fellowship with God, we need to confess our sins and He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and we are restored to that sense of fellowship with Christ that we need. That's all true. But I think that when we look at this sentence in context, when it says, Be filled with the Spirit... He goes on to explain that this means that we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. How do you get filled with the Spirit? Well, the Spirit is given to glorify the Word. The Holy Spirit comes to glorify Christ and to glorify the Word of God. And if we're going to be filled with the Spirit, we're going to have to be saturated and filled up with the Word of God. And that's not something that just happens instantly. Uh, If you confess your sins you don't suddenly have a bunch of Scripture memorized. Uh, You're going to have to take some effort to learn psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's saturation in the Word of God that leads to the filling of the Spirit. 
And that's part of what worship is all about. Worship is the time when we come and we get bombarded with the Word of God. We hear the Word of God read. We hear the Word of God preached. The Word of God is given to us in the sacraments. The Word of God is supposed to be spoken to one another as we speak. We sing the Word of God to the Lord and to one another. Notice many of the psalms are sung to one another. Like Psalm 100 is not addressed to God. Uh, It's a psalm in which we speak to one another in this psalm. Let me just read Psalm 100. Remind you of it. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord is God. It's He that's made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. You'll notice that that's not talking to the Lord. That's an exhortation to one another. And it's in worship that we are bombarded with the Word of God because that's what transforms us. It needs to go into us and become a part of us. And if we become filled with the Word of God, that's the first step of being filled with the Spirit. It's a filling up process and it's something that we need to keep alive. Scripture memory is part of it. The disciplines of the historic church of learning the Scriptures. We can't speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs unless we know them. Now, what does this mean? Speaking in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What are psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? Well, in our tradition, there's a lot of debate about what these are. Uh, The Presbyterian tradition is that these are all different kinds of psalms. That the 150 psalms of David are divided into three kinds. Some of them are psalms, some of them are hymns, and some are songs of the Spirit. That's a position that hasn't been very persuasive. Another position is that psalms and hymns and spiritual songs means what you might think initially it means. Well, first of all, psalms are the songs that are in the Bible. Hymns, well, those are the classic hymns of the church. And spiritual songs are gospel songs, a more familiar, informal type of singing. I'm not persuaded of that interpretation either. I'm not sure that the New Testament writers... uh, had quite that in mind either. I think that psalms and hymns and spiritual songs here means Scripture. I think that the psalms here are the 150 psalms of David. And then hymns and spiritual songs, or songs of the Spirit, refer to all the other songs that there are in the Bible. Like the song of Moses, the song at the Red Sea, the song of Hannah, the song of Mary, the song of Zechariah, the many songs that are in the book of Isaiah. The song in Philippians chapter 2. The song in Colossians chapter 1. Did you know that these books have songs in them? Let me read a couple of them. Colossians has a song. This is a hymn. I've been in churches where this was sung. Listen to this hymn in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 13. For he delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's the first stanza. It sings about Christ, the creator and governor of the universe. And then here's the second stanza. And it's exactly parallel to the first. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn, not of creation, but from the dead, so that he himself might have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Most scholars tell us that that's a hymn, a hymn that was sung in the early church. A spiritual song, a song inspired by the Holy Spirit. Here's another one from Philippians. Turn back a little bit to Philippians chapter 2. This is a hymn that was sung in the early church. And it just shows up here in the text. Starting in chapter 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. For although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And then the psalm changes direction. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those that are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Scholars tell us that that's almost certainly a hymn, and it certainly can be used that way. You begin to see psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. If we begin to study the Scripture looking for hymns, we find them throughout. Because when we respond to our God, we respond with hymns. Well, what we need to do then is learn these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs so that we can speak them to one another. How can we obey what Paul says here if we don't know them? I think it would be kind of hard to have conversations with one another, say, Morning, brother. Now, uh, and then you have to read something. No, we're supposed to know it by heart. It's supposed to be so much a part of the warp and woof of our being that we can talk the 150 psalms and all these other hymns and spiritual songs are in the Bible. We can talk them to each other and encourage one another. Now, probably you're not any better at that than I am. And that's something of a problem. But you know, if we want to be filled with the Spirit, first of all, we're going to have to become filled up with the Word of God. Memorizing is kind of hard. You ever gotten into a Scripture memory program and started working at memorizing Scripture? And, uh, of course, the older that we get, and I've got a lot of gray hairs here at least, the harder it is to memorize. Children memorize a lot. In Christian school, you can um, sing psalms, and, and after a few years, the kids know most of them, but... Those of us that are teaching you still don't have them memorized. If we want to be filled with the Spirit, we're going to have to, first of all, be filled with the Word. But it doesn't stop there in verse 19. Okay? Now, I, one other thing I do want to say here. Uh, I'm not saying that you can't sing hymns composed by the church in worship. Not at all. I'm just saying that here in this passage, I think Paul is talking about learning Scripture and uh, speaking to one another in Scripture. But he goes on in verse 19 and says, Singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now he's telling us that we're supposed to take these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that we know and not just speak them to one another, but sing them to God. Singing. The Spirit comes to glorify the Son. Jesus said that he would ascend to heaven and the Spirit would come and teach men about him. And the Spirit is the, glorifies the Word of God. When the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't direct people off into all kinds of fantastic searches for amazing, miraculous experiences. When the Spirit comes, he directs people back to the Scriptures. After all, he helped write it. And he's come to glorify it. And music is what glorifies words. If I just get up here and talk like this and never use my voice musically at all and just read the Scripture this way and talk to you about the truth, I think you'd probably go to sleep because my voice would not have any musical quality to it at all. Found it kind of weird, didn't it? But actually, what makes us interested in listening to speech is the fact that our voices do have musical qualities, don't they? They go up and down. And you know, if you get excited, your voice begins to take on more musical qualities and you talk loud. You talk loud if you're excited. Your voice takes on a higher, more musical quality if you're excited. And that gradually moves into singing because, you know, if you're excited, you tend to sing. And that's what glorifies words. Which sounds better to you? Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Or can we enhance that by saying, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Or if I did a little dancing up here and moved around while I read it, we would enhance the words even more. Therefore... Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. If I add bodily motions to my reading, it adds a little bit more. Now, in some languages, there are a lot more bodily motions than there are in our American English. 
But those languages tend to be more musical too. Now what happens if we take that those bodily motions and begin to extend them? We come up with dancing. You know that the, the Bible talks about dancing to the Lord. We Presbyterians don't do that, but it talks about it. I don't have any suggestions to you about how to obey that, you know, how to institute that. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to get from here to there on dancing. But I know about singing. Okay? And if I enhance the musical quality of my voice enough, it becomes singing. Singing beautifies and glorifies words. The Spirit comes to glorify Christ. And when the Spirit comes, He makes us sing the words of God. And you know, singing is the best way to memorize. If you sing the words of God, you, you will memorize the words of God. Especially if you have a good melody. And the melody sticks with you and it calls the words back to you. How many of you have a hymn or two memorized? Sure you do. You've got some hymns memorized, and what you remember in your mind is the tune and the words that go with it. And you can memorize the all 150 psalms that way. I would challenge you to make that a project in your church. To learn all the psalms so that you can sing them all. It means you'll have to make a lot of use of that psalter. Learn them so that you can sing them all. How, what would it be like in your Christian life if you had grown up and in your Christian school you had learned all 150 psalms? You had chapel every day, 15 minutes of chapel, and you sang two psalms a day and a scripture song. We did this in the Christian school that I was a part of. We sang two psalms a day and a scripture song. And the children all had the Beatitudes memorized because we sang them. They all had Philippians 2, Colossians 1 memorized. They had the Athanasian Creed memorized, which is about two pages long. And they had about 30 or 40 psalms memorized. I wish I had grown up. Can you imagine getting to be 20 years of age and already knowing all the psalms by heart? What would that do to your spiritual life? You think you might be filled with the Spirit? You think you might be better able to cope? You think you might have better things to say to your friends? What happened? You know, there was a time when Presbyterians did know all the songs. But that was a long time ago. But I would challenge you to think about working, and it takes effort, to learn the songs. If not just for yourselves, for your children. Give them what you didn't have so that when they grow up, when they're 20 years old, they know them all. Now you're going to find that the songs aren't like hymns. They're pretty strong stuff. You go beyond the uh, milk and bread to the strong meat of the words when you get into these songs. But I know that you've been singing them some on Sunday nights and at other times, and you already know that. Singing is what glorifies the Word of God. If we want to glorify and beautify the Scriptures, then we're going to sing them. And that's what the Spirit comes to do. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and singing and making melody from the heart to the Lord. The Spirit comes to glorify the words so that we present them to God. We do it to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. We don't want to live a life of dissipation, but one of concentration. And what is the most important thing that we need to concentrate on it's the person of God Himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, do you have problems with that? I do. My mind wanders during the prayers every week. Worship is the hardest thing in life. It's not the easiest. It's the hardest. Because our hearts are desperately wicked. And the thing that our, the wicked side of our nature hates the most is coming face to face with God. That's what we rebelled against. And if you have problems in your marriage or if you have problems with your parents or problems on the job, they're nothing compared to the problem that we have with Him. And so it's hard for us to concentrate and focus our attention on God. Don't tell me your mind never wanders during prayer in church. Of course it does. Because that's the hardest thing for us to do. Our rebellion in the first place was against that. Of course, the Holy Spirit has come 
next to us to pray in groanings too deep to be uttered to transform our hearts. But you know and I know that there's still a lot of problems down in there. Romans 7 tells us that we still have a desperately wicked side to our heart and that when we least expect it, our hearts throw up evil and wicked thoughts into our minds. Paul says, when I am minded to do good, that's when evil is with me. When I set out to do something good, it seems that's when this gorge of wickedness rises up the most. Well, what's the, the best thing we do is to come into the house of God and render Him formal praise. And that's when our mind begins to think of everything else. I find that. I bet you do too. I guess we're kind of dissipated, aren't we? Even if we don't come in here drunk with wine, we're kind of dissipated. But the Spirit and the Word of God will help us to overcome that and to restore our focus on the central thing, God Himself. Notice what He says, giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Worship is thanksgiving. It is an act of praise. It's not just coming and listening to a sermon. Not just coming and listening to the choir. But worship needs to be something that we throw ourselves into. Because, you see, we've got this desperate problem. And desperate problems require desperate measures. And we have to take ourselves by the hand and say, I will throw myself into the worship of God. I will actively pursue the worship of God. If you don't, if you just kind of sit there and wait for it to happen, you get dissipated. We have to take ourselves in hand and make ourselves worship the Lord because it's hard for us to do, but it's the most important thing we can do. How do we do it? Well, again, be filled with the Word, sing and make melody to God as an act of praise. Praise focuses our minds on God better than anything else. There are other kinds of prayer as well, but the overall context of worship is praise. Giving thanks, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. It's in worship that we learn to do that so we can do it during the week. The psalms and hymns you memorize in here, you can carry with you as you drive to work or as you do the dishes or whatever. This is the place to learn them. Learn to throw ourselves through an active concentration, focusing ourselves on God, stirring ourselves up to do it, to actively worship God and not just passively sit here and wait to be stimulated by something. You know, back when I uh, fell in love with my wife and we were dating, I used to sing a lot. Of course, after you get married, it kind of goes out. We won't ask how many men used to sing to their wives and then kind of stop after a while because that comes and goes. But you know, if you're in love, you sing. And if we don't sing enough, it's because we don't love enough. You know, it's also true that if you're excited, you sing. And if we're excited about God, we sing. Presbyterians just have, find it hard to get excited. No, your service is pretty good here, but I've been in some that, uh, my goodness, people didn't want to sing. They weren't excited. But the basic rule is why say it when you can sing it? You said the Apostles' Creed today. Why not sing it? I challenge you to get excited and learn to sing the Apostles' Creed. And while you're at it, the Nicene Creed. I challenge you to sing as much as you can. You don't have to be anything but Presbyterian to sing. This is our Word of God that tells us how to worship. So let me sum it up. If we want to live the abundant life, we're going to have to be full of the Spirit. And if we're going to be full of the Spirit, we're going to have to be full of the Word of God. And then we need to sing the Word of God. The church in our day needs to take seriously this matter. Uh, Your church has already made a great start because you have psalm singing in your church. But the church in general in our day is in bad shape because the psalms are just plain ignored. We've got to take ourselves in hand, train ourselves in psalm singing, and hurl those psalms before the throne of God in active praise to Him. Because this is one of the most basic keys to life, and it will lead us to the throne of God. Let's stand and pray.
Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We confess to you that we're awfully dull. It's hard for us to concentrate. It's hard for us to even think about learning more of your word. But we ask that you send your spirit to us and make us not only want to, but to be able to. Get more and more of your word down inside of ourselves and make us little words, living epistles. Help us to sing. Help us to love. Help us to be excited. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Lord and King. Amen. Let us now sing hymn 127. in glory to give praise to him for all eternity. Let us also respond to him and his speaking to us by dedicating our lives and showing that through the giving of our tithes and offerings. After the offertory we will sing the doxology and after the benediction we will sing the threefold amen which you can find in the front of your hymnals. Let us pray together. Gracious God, our Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you have called us to yourself through our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great riches he has showered upon us. We bring a portion of those today and present them at your throne in dedication of the whole of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
how to receive God's benediction. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.